Thank you and welcome everyone. Today I want to give you a little introduction to integer programming and the idea for this talk was actually born when we as a program committee for the PyCon Pi Data this year in Berlin um, had to actually solve the problem. How do we make a great agenda for the conference and how we can model this and what is optimal? So. Yeah, just a bit about myself. My name is Florian. Um, I'm a mathematician by profession. Um, also, this is the reason for the talk. I really do like mathematical modeling, so translating stuff into math, everything around analytics, data warehousing, and so on. I'm a huge fan of the Python data stack, right? And it's EuroPython here. And uh, I'm also an, an open source contributor to myself. So just um, a few words about Innovex. So my employer, uh, we are an innovation quality driven IT project house and we offer basically everything from the IT infrastructure, mostly in the cloud to application development back and front end, but also the analytics part. So that's the department I work in. And if you ever have an interesting project, come and talk to us. So I structured this talk in the way that I'm going to start really high level and abstract and going to go and get, we are getting more and more concrete as we go. So the field we are dealing with is actually the field of operations research. And some of you might know this, um, the subject from, from university. For those who don't know, the objective of operations research is the development and application of methods to support the optimal decision-making um, process. And this in various domains, manufacturing, finance, but can be many more. And typical problem classes in this field, and this is not an exhaustive list, just some examples are problems like assignment, allocation problems, like the problem I just talked about, like you have a schedule, you have some talks, and you want to assign the talks into the schedule to get some kind of agenda, and you have given some constraints like room sizes and so on. And, um, but also many other problems like a transportation problem. Imagine that you have some plans and they need goods from supplier to build something, and now you have a certain cost of each supplier delivering goods to your plans, and somehow you want to make sure that every plan gets the right amount of goods, but at the same time you want to minimize your cost of transportation. Other problems include like shortest path problem. Imagine you have a graph and a source and a sink and you ask the question, how do I get from A to B from the source to the sink, given that all your edges have a certain cost and you want to go the, the path of minimum costs. Another one is maximum flow problems. Imagine that you have some computer network and you're asking yourself, so what's the maximum number of uh, packages I can send through the network or through a pipe system. So those are typical problem classes and they can all be solved with linear programming or integer programming. And so what's the definition of this? It's, it looks like really simple. So we have some, um, some objective function, some cost function where we want to minimize over a given variable x. So this is our decision variable and we have some vector of costs uh, with, that is multiplied with x and we have some additional constraints. In this case given by some matrix A time x is um, lesser or equal than some vector b and our x, are, uh, our x is just the n-dimensional uh, real vector. So this looks really simple, this mathematical formulation. But it turns out that uh, the typical algorithms you use, like the simplex algorithm, is cubic in, uh, in its complexity on average, even exponential number of steps that you need uh, in the worst case. And there exist some methods which do it in n to the power of 2.5, which is better, but still um, not so good. But at least for typical kinds of problems, it's, it's going to be um, fast enough. But now I said that only some of those problems are linear problems. Um, many of the things like shortest path, you need actually an additional constraint. And this is the constraint here that some of your 
um, some of your components in your vector, they need to be integer. And although we are adding additional constraint and you might think, okay, this should make the problem somehow easier, it makes the problem really, really hard. So the complexity is now NP hard. And um, if you have many components, many integer components, or even if all your decision variables are, have this integer constraint, then um, the problem ro grows really um, dramatically. And uh, so what you might think, okay, why not just drop this additional constraint? And this is what's called linear relaxation. This will in practice get you um, no result, like um, if you think you could just solve it and then round to the nearest integer um, values, this uh, will not help. Um, future, uh, so additional um, special cases are that I just want to mention. So we talked about the linear case. Sometimes it's also good to have a quadratic cost functional. And in the case of um, that we're going to talk later about that all our decision variables are integer and it's no longer called integer, uh, mixed integer linear program, but just integer linear program or just integer programming. And um, quite often, it's not only integer, it's just binary. So you need to decide if it's 0 or 1. And then it's called a 0, 1 linear program. And if you wonder why this is called programming, it looks like math, right? Uh, this was a kind of uh, marketing trick that uh, George Danzig, who invented this, um, uh, this linear programming, so he coined it programming because back in the 1940s, uh, so during war times, um, programming was more used uh, for term for planning and structuring things and getting to a goal. So um, this sounded more like practical and that was the way at the time to, to get money um, to be concrete and uh, rather practical than just abstract math. So um, no talk about integer programming and linear programming without the kind of hello world of integer programming, which is the knapsack problem. And I think this example shows really nicely how you do the mathematical modeling, how you come from, from a concrete use case in the real world to some mathematical formulation to solve it. So imagine that um, you have uh, a backpack and you have a set of items and now you need to decide which kind of items you want to take with you. And each item has a weight and some, some value. And of course, you can only carry so much weight. So you have some kind of constraint what the maximum weight is of all those items. And on the other hand, you want to maximize the value of those items that you want to take with you. So this kind of the, 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 our, um, our objective to maximize the value is translated into our objective function. So this time we maximize and we just multiply our decision variable, which is 0 or 1 with the, the value, depending on if we decided to take it with us or leave it there. And the same goes for our constraint that kind of selects those uh, weights which we decided to put into our um, backpack. So this um, looks really easy enough in, in practice. It's kind of the, the, the high art of translating a problem like this into the mathematical formulation. So beforehand, I, um, I stated this, that solving those problems is NP-hard. So what do we do now in practice? So there are typically or basically two common heuristics, the cutting plane method and the branch and bound methods, which are often combined as branch and cut methods. And I just want to give you an idea how those methods work. Um, they are heuristics, so you have no guarantee, but in practice they um, yeah, help you to get the job done and solve the problems. So um, the, the main idea of the cutting plane method is that you do the 
relaxation, so you just forget about the additional constraint that it needs to be integer. You solve this problem, for instance, using the simplex algorithm or an interior point, and maybe you're lucky and the solution is integral. Mostly it will not be. So what you do is now you add an additional constraint that excludes the non-integer solution, but none of the interior points, and then you repeat and repeat and repeat. And this gets you um, eventually to the right solution. So um, it's actually much easier to see this in a small example. So in a, in a 2D, a 2D problem is uh, quite easy to, to visualize. So we have our um, objective function that we want to uh, maximize x1 plus x2. We have constraints which um, can be interpreted as just as those lines and additionally one would be positive. So all our feasible points, so that's the bright blue dots here, all those points fulfill our constraints and the red one would be the solution just by looking at it and the, the dotted line, this is like the ESO line. So on this line, the objective function has a constant value. And now what you can do graphically is that along the normal to this ESO line, you just move it in this direction and up to the point um, where it's still in the, um, in the domain of the feasible points. So if we now wouldn't know the solution, we could do the relaxation. So this means if we move this up, so this would be our solution um, 2 and 2.5, which is not integral. We add an additional constraint. We could, for instance, say we want to cut away everything up here. So we add this constraint, then we solve again. So this time, this would be our solution uh, using the simplex algorithm, for instance. And uh, again, we are not integral. So we add one more constraint. And you can directly see in this case, we um, have then found um, a solution which is integral using the simplex by just adding more and more constraints. And now the, the art of those heuristic is finding the right constraints because if you add wrong constraints in the end you will um, yeah, increase the problem more and more and uh, you need too many iterations and then um, uh, you will have uh, an exponential complexity. The other method, um, branch and bound, I just want to give the, the, the idea how it works. It's a kind of a smart trick. So we solve again the relaxed LP problem and then we decide for one of the components, which is not integral, and we add two problems out of it. So one by saying, uh, by adding an additional constraint that xi is smaller or equal than the, the floor, um, so the lower bound of our, um, of our solution um, component, and the other one larger or equal than the, the ceiling. And this gets us in the end some graph if you do this over and over and uh, you can eliminate some of the branch, uh, branches by exploiting this inequality. So of course uh, a feasible solution is always smaller than an optimal solution. So just by definition if you maximize and um, the solution of a relaxed problem of a relaxation uh, will always be larger or equal than the optimal solution. That means whenever somewhere in your graph you found a feasible solution and the relaxed solution of one of the subproblems is smaller, then you know, okay, I don't need to look in those kind of sub-branches anymore um, because I will not find something that is better. And uh, so how can we now apply this to conference scheduling? Um, imagine you have a number of talks, so some, some speakers sent in talks, you accept it then, and then you already define some schedule where you say, okay, there's a morning session, an afternoon session, there are a certain number of rooms and maybe a certain number of days, and now our task is to decide which talk should go into which slot. So, now, 
the real question is, so do we have any constraints and can we state those constraints? They are like really easy constraints. For instance, each talk must be assigned exactly once, right? Uh, so no one wants to give a talk two times at the same conference. Then um, there's also a constraint that um, each time slot room combination can only be occupied by one talk at most. This would be kind of strange, two speakers talking at the same time. Um, then the length of the time slots, like we had, uh, we had 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 90 minutes slots must match the length of the talk. If there's certain tutorials that have a part one and two, they should be consecutive. And uh, those are like the, the really the hard constraints. Now talking about the objective, of course, you always have some speaker that gives you certain kind of preferences that they would like to speak on a, on a certain day. And of course, um, the, also the keynote speakers and so on. So you will have certain preferences. One could put those into, um, constraints, but then it might happen that you have no solution at all, so it's good to have this in an objective. Then there's the popularity of, of the talk, that you want to be reflected in the room size. So also, uh, I think it was the same for EuroPython, but also for PyCon PyD, we had a, a voting beforehand, who wants to see or what, how you like the different talks, just by looking at the abstract and the title, and this way we already had the information that certain talks are more popular and, uh, than others, and then of course a more popular talk should go into a more popular room. By the same information, um, it also is interesting that you could optimize that if a lot of people want to see two talks, then those two talks should not be at the same time, just in different rooms, right? So um, they should be one after another, so that people have the chance to see both talks. Um, the same idea is with tracks, so we had different tracks like PyData, PyCon, and also subtracks like PyData uh, data handling. And if one session, um, which are like three slots, if they have the same track or maybe even subtrack, then the likelihood that people don't need to change the room as often is really high. So this is also something you might want to optimize for. And since this is kind of, we have now multi-objectives, right, five uh, parts, and somehow we need to bring them in an order what is more important for us um, than um, the others. So there um, we decided to go for one is more important than two, more important than three, um, and to get in the end to some uh, final solution. There are also techniques to solve for them at the same time to get more like a whole space of solution. Uh, this is um, the, the goal of multi-objective um, optimization. And there will be uh, also a talk, I think even after this talk, directly about this. And so let's say we have stated now those um, constraints and the objectives and so on, um, how do we now get this into, into Python and how do we solve it like really practically? So first of all, there's, um, there's the separation into frameworks which help you to formulate a problem and they will in the end give you some standardized format, basically the, the mathematical formulation that I showed before and this can then be fed into a solver. So you can take whatever you want from the first and um, they are all compatible with the, with, the, with the different kinds of solvers. So since I'm a huge fan of open source, I decided for Payomo. I heard that Pulp is also a really cool tool. And then there's AMPL uh, or Ample is maybe the most well known but commercial one. And from the different solvers, uh, Hikes is quite uh, new. Um, so I, um, some colleague recommended this one, so I opted to use this one. So how does it now all look in, um, in, in Python? Just to give you a little idea um, how you then formulate a problem like this. So we, we define our model, so this was the PyCon DE PyData schedule. We have different kind of sets, so to help express our constraints and our objectives later on. So we have the set of all talks. 
Then we have another dimension and another index set for the days, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. Then we had uh, different sessions, two in the morning, two in the uh, afternoon. And each, set, uh, each session is comprised of, of up to three slots, so first, second, and third. Then there were, uh, I think it was like five rooms. And um, then we had a different m track names like PyCon, PyData, and um, the subtrack ones. So now in PyOMO, you have the, the parameters. So the parameters are the things you, you give into your problem, um, but there are no, no variables. Um, so they are depending on your, um, yeah, on how you formulate the problem, like the preference that uh, for some uh, speakers and those are the, the the code names of the talks and they stand for a speaker let's say they really like to give the talk on monday then um, we set the parameter to to one for this talk and and, and speaker so to make to to um, to express that there's a certain preference for this slot and zero um, in case um, it's, it's not one of the Monday slots and so on. There's an example for Monday morning. So I stripped the code uh, down. It was way more complex uh, than, than this. And by this, you can then uh, define, for instance, the preferences for the parameters. And those will, um, uh, the preferences as parameters, and those will, in the end, then end up after Payomo does its trick and, for, and, and combine everything into this mathematical formulation as things in the, in the cost functional, uh, in, the, in the C we saw before, this cost vector. So uh, then, of course, we have the decision variable. So this is what we are interested in in the end, right? So we have a variable over all those different uh, indices that we just said. So you already see here that this is quite high dimensional and the domain is binary. So it's just zero or one. So you can imagine, so if for a given index set here, we have a one, we know that that talk will happen at the given day, at the given session, at the slot, at the given uh, room then what you always need is a lot of auxiliary variables like um, to say um, if a talk happens at a certain room, so we see we have only the two indexes, also for parallel uh, tracks, it's everything except of the room, and uh, you know if you would um, sum over this uh, dimension, for instance, then you get the sum of uh, talks at the, at the same time. So now um, the really interesting and, and, and really one of the hardest part is like defining now constraints. So we talked about the one constraint that we only want to have uh, one talk at most for each room time slot combination. And um, there we just, um, we can just sum in our decision variable over all the talks for um, for a given day, session, slot, and room. And if this sum is smaller or equal than one, then um, this is fulfilled. So then we know there was assigned only um, like one talk at most. And you see that already here, we, we are adding a lot of constraints. And um, this is a quite a simple one. Then here um, to, to um, give the constraint that the talk length actually fits the, the, the slot length, we multiply the decision variable, which will be a zero uh, in many cases, with the slot length, except of the one where it is assigned to the slot. Then it, this uh, multiplication will lead to the slot length, and this should be equal to the talk length. So this looks a lot, maybe much more complicated than maybe you would uh, formulate this. And why is it like this? Why does it need to be formulated like this? Because we have the linearity constraint, right? We have to make really sure that we don't do things like um, multiplying variables and so on. So this is uh, like the hard part, formulating things like this. Now talking, to the, uh, talking about the objective, in case of the, uh, the preferences, we can just multiply the preferences with a, with a, with a schedule. 
um, to get the, the first term. Uh, the same is with the room capacity. Then uh, for the co-occurrences, um, it's, uh, it's, it's similar. And um, also for the other terms, and now since we know what kind of the, the range of value of each term is, we can just express, for instance, this fact that the preference is way more important than the other things by multiplying it with a high number. So this is one way to kind of push in this fact that we first want to fulfill the preferences and um, only then the, um, the penalty for not hitting the right room capacity should be fulfilled. Yeah, and in the end, uh, it looks, uh, this is a visualization of one of the results uh, we had. Um, it looks kind of unimpressive, but uh, in the end, you then have um, which talk is assigned to what, and this ran for 48 hours, and it was still not completely uh, solved, but you know how far away you are from the, from the right uh, answer. So we took this solution. So if you wonder about the NIN, so some of the slots we just wanted to be empty. So those, um, this is, is, is just normal. And um, yeah, if you're interested in how we did it in detail, so we also um, released a package called Pythonis, where you also have uh, pre-talk clients, whatever, to organize community events. And one of the notebooks holds this um, formulation. So you might now say, hey, sounds easy enough. Uh, I want to go for it. And um, there's one um, final remark I want to uh, say, because for me, it was a really brain twist to get into this, um, to, to, to fulfill the, the linearity terms. Because for instance, if you want to say that something should not deviate so much from something else, you would normally take something like a root mean squared error, but of course this is not linear. Then you think, okay, why not take uh, the absolute value? But also this is not linear, but you can linearize it. So how do you linearize it? Um, let's say you wanted to have uh, the absolute value of x in your objective function. You could just say, well, I express, I add a additional uh, auxiliary variables, uh, t1 and t2, and I express it like this. So what we have, like graphically, so this is our x, and this is now this t1 plus t2. Um, and now just flipping it in the objective, so putting now t1 plus t2 in the objective will lead to what you actually uh, want, uh, wanted to in the first place. You introduced additional variables, additional constraints, and a lot of designing and modeling something like this is about coming up um, with, um, with tricks like this. And there's the big M method and, and many more and many more. So um, yeah, it's uh, really interesting. So the main takeaways, we learned that uh, mixed integer linear programming is part of operation research. We talked about um, the optimal decision and the knapsack problem. We learned that uh, those problems are um, or have an NP hard complexity or are NP hard and you can solve them with branch and cut in a, in a heuristic way. That there's Payomo and also Higgs to formulate and to, trans to solve the problem. And um, actually, the hardest part is the linearity. With this, I want to start, check out my, my uh, want to end. Uh, check out my references. Um, I took a lot of inspiration from other talks and also lectures. And with this, I want to say thank you.